I love the book of Esther. I'm actually writing a book on it at the moment. And uh, it's really the story of two queens. One who was rejected and one who was accepted. And in uh, chapter 1 and verse 19, we read this testimony of Vashti, the husband of King Ahasuerus. And uh, I want us to understand this morning that the great banquet of Ahasuerus is a type of the marriage supper of the Lamb. And uh, in the midst of this great banquet, the king sends for his bride because above everything in his kingdom, all the gold and the silver and the magnificence of what he has, his armies and his generals and his commanders, there's one person that is outstanding far and above all of them, and that's his bride. Amen? And so he says, he's, he actually, he sends seven, seven, that number of God. He just doesn't send anybody. He seven, sends his seven chamberlains to request Vashti, his bride, to come and stand beside him in the midst of this great banquet. And his order is for her to put on the crown and her royal robes and come and appear to be his complement. Amen. Have we got that? You know, I, I think so many spouses are fighting each other as to who is going to rise up and be the head and and, and don't push me down and don't silence me and don't quench me and so on and so forth. No, we are meant to compliment. And we are meant to compliment our bridegroom, who is the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Vashti the queen, put on your royal robes, put on the regalia of your authority. That's what I want us to understand. He's not calling this queen to come and make a spectacle of her. He's calling her to come and stand beside him as his greatest treasure. And if we stop to think this morning about what God has done in sending the Holy Spirit, you know, I'm so tired of the way the church treats this third glorious person of God who has been a slave on the earth for 2,000 years, doing what? First of all, finding us, yeah? And then shaping us into being the bride that is fit to stand beside Christ. So when the Holy Spirit comes into your life and he starts knocking you about, yeah? and sometimes it's not pleasant, just know that he's shaping you to stand next to Christ. He's shaping you to be the complement of Christ. He's shaping you to be the person that can shine for the Lord in the midst of no matter what the crisis is, no matter what the situation is. And what do we want to do? We want to hide in our little rabbit warren, yeah, don't we? How many people in this crisis that we're facing... I, I don't think America has faced a crisis like this, yes? And what do we want to do? We want to hide away, crawl into my little hole, disappear. No, 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 this is our time to shine for Jesus. This is our time to stand out, yeah, as the bride of Christ, as the complement of Christ, amen, and say, I am here for his glory, that's, that's, what, that's, that's what we are purposed to do, everybody. We are here to shine for his glory. Amen? And uh, we really need to do that. So here's Vashti. She, seven chamberlains come to call her, come and be in the presence of the king. He wants to show off his greatest treasure to the whole kingdom. Is it because we don't have so much self-worth, do we? We have a low self-worth. 
Who am I? How many times do you say, hear people say that? Who am I? The moment that I hear somebody say, who am I? I'm just nothing. Well, then you'll always remain nothing. Yeah? No. I am the glorious, victorious, overcoming, conquering bride of Christ. Amen? I don't see myself as nothing. I see myself as being transformed by the power of God, yeah, gloriously gifted, anointed for him, for his purpose, for his glory, amen? And he has redeemed us. It's, you know, we, we sing these songs about salvation, and that's all good and well, but that's not where we're meant to tabernacle. He saved us for a purpose, and the purpose that he saved us, beloved, is that we should be overcomers and conquerors, more than conquerors. We have been seated in Christ in heavenly places to do what? To rule and reign now. To rule and reign over my circumstances. To rule and reign over my situation. To rule and reign over the people around me. To rule and reign over my family. Amen. You know, how many people do you know are living in fear? Come on. Yeah, but you know, fear is a spirit. And the Bible says perfect love casts out all fear. And we have authority. Oh, so my friend, you are under fear. I'm laying my hands on you right now. In the name of Jesus Christ, spirit of fear, depart. Why are you all looking at me like I came from Africa? Yeah. We have that authority, but we don't exercise it. We say to people, oh, shame, 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 shame. No. Lay hands on them. Pray for them. Exercise the authority that God has given you to be his bride and to shine for his glory. Amen? So, you know, uh, Vashti, The queen refuses to come at the commandment of the king. And so verse 19 says, Let her royal estate be taken away and given to another that is better than she. How many people have sat in the body of Christ for years and years and years and have never risen up to be who God wants him to be and you wonder why you don't have that royal estate You wonder why somebody else, some younger person or some newly saved person seems to be rising up and taking a place of authority. They say, who are you? Who are you? Who am I? I'm the bride of Christ. I'm the beautiful, wonderful, victorious, conquering bride of the Lord Jesus Christ. And nobody's going to silence me. Nobody's going to put me down. Yes, there are battles. Yes, there are fights. Yes, we've got to know who we are. And we've got to rise up to be who Christ wants us to be. And who does Christ want us to be? He wants us to be like him as he is now, everybody. He's not the Christ of the cross. He's not the Christ of the resurrection. He's the Christ of the ascension who is seated at the right hand of the majesty on a high, and he carried me with him to that place to rule and reign over all circumstance and situation now for his glory, for his glory. Yeah? I know that there are many believers who want the rapture to come and take us all away. God bless you if you think that. I wish it's going to happen. For your sake, but it isn't. So what's going to happen? When Jesus Christ comes back as King of kings and Lord of lords, and you really need to buy my book, The Triumphant King Returns. It will, be a, it will give you a perspective on the second coming of Christ that you've probably never had, and I can tell you it's accurate. Amen? When Jesus Christ comes back and we get caught up To meet him in the air, and that's what the Bible says, amen? So if you want a rapture, God bless you, but it's not going to happen. 
We're going to see the Antichrist. We're going to see all the things that are book, written in the book of Revelation. And at the very end, we're going to get caught up to meet him in the air as he returns. And how is he returning? He's returning as king of kings and lord of lords. He is returning with the wrath of God to press down the winepress of God's wrath against all wickedness that has taken place on planet earth. Come on, everyone. You know, don't you get indignant when you hear these stupid liberal humanist nonsense? Yeah? Sloppy Joe. What a joke. Huh? You all know what a sloppy Joe is, don't you? Your opposition leader. Yeah. What, what a joke. A a, a God-hating, yeah, God-hating man, and all of these liberals who sit in your Congress that are God-hating men and women, they they need to be snuffed out. Yes? Seems that everything that stands for good and right, yeah, is a problem today. That means you. That means you. It's like, no, I'm going to rise up and I'm going to shine for Jesus. Hmm? Doesn't matter what everybody's saying. Doesn't matter what everybody's doing. We are here as representations, as the bride of Christ, which means that I need to align myself with the character and nature of my bridegroom. I need to be like my bridegroom. I don't need a wimpy Jesus. Amen? I need a conquering, overcoming, powerful, victorious Jesus as he really is. You know, the problem with the church is we've represented Jesus as a mamby-pamby to the world. Oh, love me, love my sin. Amen? Amen? Instead of this victorious. And so Vashti the queen, she refuses to come at the king's request. Come and stand next to me. I want my whole empire to see your glory, to see your power, to see who you are. Because the Bible says she was fair to look upon. I know she's having her party with the queen, with the women. And beloved, how many times when the Holy Spirit of God comes, he wants our instant attention, and what are we doing? We're partying. We're having our little get-together. And the Holy Spirit moves upon us, and he says, draw aside, come to me now. No, I'm too busy. I'm too busy partying with the women, partying with the others, the You know, if if there's anything that has become entertainment, it's the church. I hate the entertainment mentality of the church. We are needing a people that are glorious and powerful and strong who are going out to the battle to fight the fight for the glory of God. Hallelujah. You know, my grandfather was at one of the famous battles in World War I, it was the Battle of Mons. And uh, where all the trenches were. And the Germans had utterly defeated the British. Uh, my grandfather was not a spiritual man. He was not born again. But they had a chaplain of his unit that really loved the Lord. And so the following day, the British knew that they were going to be utterly defeated by the Germans. And so this chaplain called everybody together and he prayed and he asked God to intervene as only God could and as God had done many times in the word of God. And my grandfather testified how the next morning at daybreak as the sun was beginning to rise, the sky, the eastern sky was full of angels. 
And uh, they went out into battle, and the stiff upper lip British were not going to die in the trenches. Or they were not going to die like rabbits in a hole. They were going to go out and they were going to face the Germans and they were going to die like real men. So they sent the musicians, the drummers, the buglers, the bagpipe players. They sent them ahead and this ragtag British army followed behind to fight the Germans and a total miracle, just as has happened in the word of God, a total miracle took place and the Germans were defeated by this ragtag British army. That's God. That's God, everybody. That's like, I'm going to rise up. I'm not going to sit here. You know, it reminds me of those lepers, those four lepers. Sit we here to die? What have we got to lose? If we, if we, if we go to the camp of the Syrians, at least we may get food and we may survive. Yeah? But if we sit here, we're surely going to die. Why sit we here to die? Christians are full of that. Oh, let's just sit down and see what happens. No, I'm going to get up and move. I'm going to get up and shake. I'm going to get up and do something. I'm going to get up and, and, and make my life count. And in the process of making my life count, if I die, I die, so what? Somebody shout hallelujah. All right, so then there's Esther. This orphan girl brought up by her uncle. Yeah. And four years after Vashti has been deposed, and I want us to understand that Ahasuerus had every right to execute Vashti, but he didn't. He banishes her. And... Uh, Four years later, when Esther comes into his royal chambers, she finds such delight in the eyes of the king that he picks up the crown and he puts it on her head and tells her she's now the queen. Think about that. Think about that. That we come into the presence of God and we're... What are we here to do? We're here to worship him. We're here to adore him. We're here to magnify and exalt him. How many of you husbands, wives, wake your spouse up at 2 o'clock in the morning and say, Honey, I love you. So don't be stupid. <laughs> I'm sleepy. No, I love you. You're the best thing that happened to me. You know, that's all it takes. What are you going to do in the, in the morning when you wake up and you remember, wow, my husband or my wife told me how much they loved me in the middle of the night. Dream on, pastor. <laughs> that's going to go with you the whole day. That's going to infuse you, isn't it? It's going to do something inside of you. And think about this as a, as you get up in the middle of the night, instead of grumbling and complaining, you know, wow, God, I love you. Jesus, you're the best thing that ever happened to me. You're my wonderful bridegroom. Amen. Imagine what that does in the heart of the Lord Jesus Christ and what benefit and blessing it is to us because when we start to tell him, how magnificent is he is. How glorious he is. How wonderful. What a bridegroom you are, Lord. I want to be like you. Prophet Isaiah says, in that day, which day is he talking about? The day we're living in. In that day, seven women. Now, that doesn't mean seven literal women. It's seven is the number of God. It's the bride of Christ. Seven women. Now, the bride of Christ will take hold of the bridegroom and say, I will work my works, I will eat my food, but there's only one thing that I desire, to be known by your name, to be called by your name. Amen? Isn't that a true picture of the bride? You know, we are supposed to give up our identity and take on the identity of the bridegroom. 
Mm -hmm. Now women don't even want to change their name. But we are being changed by the power of the Holy Spirit, this wonderful, dynamic third person of God. We are being changed from glory to glory, glory to glory, to the image of Christ. So when Jesus Christ returns, how is he going to return? The man be pan be savior of the world. No, he's coming back as king of kings and lord of lords. He's coming back as the great majesty. He's coming back full of glory. Hallelujah. And that's the kind of bride that Christ is looking for. That's the kind of bride that God wants for his son. Somebody that can stand next to the bridegroom and compliment him. Hallelujah. Wow. Doesn't that get you stirred up? It sure gets me stirred up. It's like, Lord, I want to step out into the world and make my life to really count for you. You know, we, ha we have a school of 800 in Malawi. School just started recently again. And uh, of course, the government came in and you got to put up all the placards and the COVID-19 nonsense and whatever, whatever. No mask, no entry. So every, everybody that enters the school, I say, what are you wearing a mask for? Because your sign says so. Yeah, take it off. <laughs> no, <laughs> no pointing my finger, but I don't see very many here wearing masks. So, I want us to listen to this. So I said, when the government came in and started to tell us we had to put up all these placards and you know, billboards and you name it about how social distancing and the whole bang shoot that you got here, I said, we are not, yeah, we've got to put it up, we put it up. But we're not going to leave it like that. I want everybody that reads these placards and billboards and whatever else to know that there's a God that is bigger than all of this. So, I had one of my staff members go to town and have printed, beautifully done, laminated, Psalm 91. Psalm 91. He that abides under the shadow of the Almighty. Hallelujah. So, they printed out a couple of hundred uh, copies of Psalm 91 and all of its verses, and we stuck them up next to all of these requirements of the government. The Lord is going to transcend everything. And <clears throat> not long after that, the Minister of Education arrived at the school. <laughs> oh, I love it, don't you? Yes! And uh, she said, I'd heard a lot about you as a man of God. I heard a lot about what goes on in your academy. I said, yeah. She said, you know, Pastor, I would have been very disappointed if you hadn't put up all this stuff. <laughs> Come on, everybody. She said, that's a testimony to the glory of God. No, yes, okay, the government's got it say. We'll obey what the government says. Yeah? But there's a God who's bigger than everything. There's a God that's bigger than my family. There's a God that's bigger than my government. There's a God that's bigger than my state. There's a God that transcends everything, beloved. And that's what people want to see. They want to see you bold. They want to see you with authority. They want to see you standing in the midst of the confusion and the fear and the doubt. What a, what a testimony am I to my family? What a testimony am I to my people that I work with? What a testimony am I when I go shopping and I go to the garage, the filling station, or whatever you want to... You know, it, it's, it's, I, I need to shine for Jesus. I'm not saying being defiant. I am saying I need to shine for Jesus. I need everybody to know that there's no fear in me. Amen? And even if anything happens, I've got a better place to go to. Yeah? 
People often say to me in Africa, yeah, but pastor, well, what about my family? Well, you won't know anything about your family. You're gone. What are you worried about? So here's Esther, this beautiful God-anointed, because God was all on the inside of her, and that's what we need, beloved, in these days. We need to get God on the inside of us. We need to get God so powerful, so excited, so glorious on the inside of us that he radiates from out of us. You know, I was listening to a pastor a few days ago on one of our travels, and uh, he was just an empty vessel, just a noisy empty vessel. Every time he shouted hallelujah, There was no substance to it. There was no depth to it. And I said to myself, that man is either in sin or he's so far away from God that it's not funny. Shut up. Yeah, shut up. That's a a nice word. You don't use it anymore, but we do. And it's got power. You know, when I walk into the hall and there's teachers and prefects saying, Everybody keep quiet, keep quiet. They're like little parrots, you know. Keep quiet, keep quiet. And I walk, shut up! <laughs> Instant silence. <laughs> you know, I, 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 I never forget when Pastor Dutch came to Sudan. So I, I had to go and get something from our base camp. And, I, and here all these little, there's this roped off area for the dignitaries, you see. And I'm saying, Pastor Dutch, please don't let any of these little snot-nosed rugrats get in this, because once they're in, they stay. So, (laughs) 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 so off I go, don't worry, everything's under control, so off I go, and I come back, and there's about a hundred little kids inside this roped-off area, and and, and Pastor Dutch is grabbing them by the arm and trying to shoo them out, come on, out, 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 now. I said, Dutch, Let me show you how you do it. I walked over to the nearest tree, broke off a branch, marched out, all of you, out. They were gone. I said, this is Africa, and this is how we do it in Africa. (laughs) And this is, but but you know what? We, We have socialized ourselves and socialized one another into a certain way of behavior that is not biblical. That is not biblical at all. You know, I can't wait for the Antichrist system to be confronted by Jesus Christ, the coming King. Oh my goodness, the fear. And what I love about Esther, this woman who's full of God on the inside, radiates God on the outside, She is not going to be put down. Yes? And when the king who was busy preparing for a great war against the Greeks and hasn't sent for his wife because he's so wrapped up in preparing for this war for a month, yeah? She says, no, fast fast with me. Three days, three nights, no eating, no drinking, and then I'll go into the presence of the king And if I perish, I perish. Whoa, that's a great attitude. If I perish, I perish. But after three days of fasting, that anointing, that beauty, that majesty all over her. So when she comes into the presence of the king, and there's Haman obviously wanting to execute her and some of his men, and the king holds out the golden scepter, she's acceptable to me. She's acceptable to me. And brother, that should be our design that the Lord, as it were, holds out his golden scepter to us. You're acceptable to me because the beauty of Christ in you, the beauty of Christ all over you, just draws you to me. Hallelujah. And that's what we should be aiming for in our lives, that God, I'm shining for you. I'm here for your glory. I'm here for your authority and your power. And, and, and what I love about Esther, and I want you to hear this loud and clear, you know, the king offers her 
three separate times he offers her to the half of my kingdom. Yes, you're my compliment. What would you have, Queen Esther? To the half of my kingdom. And the book of Ephesians tells us that God has an inheritance in us as much as we have an inheritance in him. Come on. What's God's inheritance in you? What has God got in you? We love to talk about, you know, what I have in Christ, who I am in Christ. But God has an inheritance in you. What is that inheritance? We should be conquering, overcoming, powerful, glorious, victorious vessels for the almighty king. That should be the inheritance that he finds in me. The complement of his bridegroom. And, uh, 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 and Esther said, no, 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 no. I, I'm not interested in half the kingdom. Why? Why would she be? She already has it. She already has it. This is a great love story, the book of Esther. It's one of the great love stories of the Bible, and yet we, we haven't seen it. We don't see it. Because all, we've, all we can see in the book of Esther is, is the salvation of the Jews. And so, when Haman is exposed, and the king realizes, because he hasn't realized up to this point that his wife is a Jewess, that she's going to be executed together with all the Jews in the kingdom. Yeah? No. I'm going to stand for what is right. And so... She has Mordecai, I mean, she has Haman hanged on his own gallows. And then Esther's, and I want us to see this, Esther's attitude is, Haman is not enough. I want his wife and all of his king, kids hanged on the same gallows because I'm not going to allow another root to rise up and destroy my people in this kingdom as has happened before. And that, sh that, that should be the part of our nature. Yeah, where the enemy comes in. Where the enemy raises up people. We should have no mercy on people who willingly give themselves into the hands of Satan. To be used of him to destroy the people of God. Even if they're Christians. Sorry, no room for you here. Out. You want to stand up against the kingdom of God? You want to stand up against the kingdom of God in me? You want to stand up against the, the bride of Christ in me? I want to tell you, you're dealing with something very serious, and I will have no mercy. You say, what? Yes. No mercy for those who want to destroy you because of the enemy. It's time that we changed our attitude and changed our focus and become the people that God really wants us to be. I want to be the bride that stands next to the bridegroom and compliments him in everything that he is. Hallelujah. Not the one who says, no, I'm busy with my woman and is banished. Let us pray. Father, we glorify your name. We exalt you. We thank you. We praise you. We're so blessed, Lord, to be your children. And I'm asking you today, Father, that you would stir up inside of each one of us that passion to be the true bride of Christ and to behave the way that Christ expects us to behave as he is now. So are we in this world. Father, I need to know how Jesus is so that I can be his complement for your glory. 